I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about jQuery plugins, auto prefixing, CSS sprites, and more. Let's check it out. First up is the Responsinator. It's basically a website where you can just type in the URL of your website and it will load it into a couple of different resolutions. Rather than talk about it, let me just show it to you. Here I've loaded up teamtreehouse.com and as you can see, it's put it into the resolution of your typical iPhone. Actually, this is iPhone 3 and 4 in portrait mode. If we scroll down a little bit further, you can see that there are a couple of other examples. And once you get past the iPhones, you get to the crappy Android portrait, which it says right here on the page. And there's crappy Android landscape, a Samsung Galaxy, and a couple of tablets, and you get the idea. This isn't nearly as good as actual hardware testing. You always want to try and test on the real hardware if you can, or use a screenshot service like browser shots, but this is pretty good if you just want to quickly put your website in there and see if it looks good at those different resolutions. Yeah, test out some breakpoints. Yeah, like, exactly. Make a day of it. Sounds fun. Yeah, Sunday. Mm. Breakpoint testing day. I'll be there. Yeah. Next up, we have a website slash project called jQuery Boilerplate. This is the guide to jQuery plugins. So this is actually a project which will help with creating a jQuery plugin. And you can also read about established patterns for jQuery plugin development. So uh, first thing they have here is boilerplate. This is a template for creating a jQuery plugin. Now this uses, um, uh, let's see, this uses a default plugin with some default structure that you have. It gives a, a demo with an index page, uh, includes jQuery, um, even some CoffeeScript as well. Now this uses Grunt in order to do its work. We've talked about Grunt before. Uh, it's essentially a task management system for JavaScript. And there's just a great description of what goes in each one of these different folders. Now, you might say, wow, that, that's amazing. Are we done? No, we're not done. There's an entire guide to patterns um, of jQuery development, as well as guides on what you might want to do. So if you take a look at the patterns folder in here, you can see there's patterns for just a basic plugin, the best way to do options, create custom events, um, or even have all sorts of widgets and factories. Anyway, this is an incredible website. Uh, go ahead, check it out, jQuery Boilerplate. We'll have a link to it in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash gotreehouse, or in iTunes, search for us at The Treehouse Show. Now, speaking of Grunt, next up is Auto Prefixer, which we'll get to the Grunt part in just a second. But Auto Prefixer is basically this piece of JavaScript that will automatically prefix your CSS with all the different vendor prefixes that you might need. Why do you think they named it that then? Maybe because that's exactly what it does. Huh. It uses the Can I Use database, which is a popular website for checking browser compatibility with various. CSS and HTML components. We've talked about that on the show before. To determine which vendor prefixes it should use. So in your code, you would actually use the normal W3C standard CSS, and then this piece of JavaScript will automatically prefix it as needed. Hmm. So if we take a look at the GitHub page here for auto prefixer and scroll down, you can see that it uses actual data from can I use. I know it's true because I read it on the internet right here. And it will go ahead and take code and compile it as needed. So for example, if you actually have older prefixes that are no longer needed, it will even go so far as removing them. So pretty impressive stuff. Here's another example using Flexbox. We have display flex here on an anchor element and it will actually compile it for all the various browsers and apply the vendor prefixes that you need, and even in the proper order using the standard version last, of course. It uh, is pretty good, and the cool thing about it is that it can be used with a bunch of different tool chains. So there's a gem for Ruby on Rails, 
And like I said at the beginning of this segment, speaking of Grunt, they recommend using the Grunt Auto Prefixer plugin if that is the tool chain that you use. So very cool stuff. And of course, if you don't use any kind of tool chain, you can download the standalone version and just include it in your website and write your CSS as standard as could be. Really tied it together in the end there. I was worried we weren't going to make that grunt connection. We made it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Next up, we have a project called Glue. Glue is something that you can use to generate CSS sprites. CSS spriting is a technique where you combine many different images into one image and then manipulate the position using CSS. This is useful for saving time when downloading a ton of different images. It can be much quicker to download one image rather than, say, 10, 12, or in the case of one of the icons that they have in here, 441. Of course, anytime you can reduce the number of HTTP requests on your website, it's a good thing. Yeah, we're going to make a t-shirt that says that. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, Glue is actually a command line program, and it's pretty easy to use. So they have a great guide to everything that happens inside of Glue. So um, what you can do, you create a new folder. In this example, it's icons, and then you add as many as you want to the folder, and then you just type in this command, Glue icons sprites, and boom, you get your CSS file and you get your PNG file. This is the fam 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 icon set turned into one single sprite. Um, now you'll notice that there is quite a hefty savings here. The icons are 4.2 megs versus one PNG file of 401 kilobytes. Wow. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Uh, and it's great, it generates just all of the CSS that you need, as you can see right there. There's also a ton of different options with, which this thi uh, with this. You can add in cropping, borders, uh, transparency, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so definitely check that out. There's binaries for Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever you want. Well, I'm going to try to glue the last segment together with this one. We're going to take a look at Cardinal, which happens to be the color of Jason's shirt. I'll leave it up to the viewer to decide whether or not that segue really worked. Cardinal is a CSS framework that takes a mobile-first approach. Uh, there are, of course, tons of choices when it comes to CSS frameworks, but variety is never a bad thing with, uh, with this sort of thing. You want to have a CSS framework that's going to work for your application and your particular style. So Cardinal is still pretty new. As you can see, it's in version 0.3.7. Of course, version numbers never really meant much on the web, so it's good to go right now. If we scroll down, you can see that the styling for Cardinal is right here. There it is. Uh, it uses a flat style, and when they say flat, they mean super flat. It's just basically square boxes with a gray background applied. Uh, oh, no, I take that back. We do have some rounded shape he shapes here and even a pill shape. Um, there's a couple of different styles here, but the thing that I really like about Cardinal is that it's very simple. I mean, just look at these tables here. They're actually hardly styled at all, uh, just basically taking away the default browser styling and applying something that just looks decent. So if you're not into all of the styling that, say, something like Bootstrap applies or Foundation, uh, this is a much better alternative that just keeps things super simple, allows you to do a responsive grid, and allows you to apply your own styling very easily. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Like the name, too. Yeah. Didn't, it didn't make me want to grunt. Next up, we have a blog post over on Code Drops on creating the Google Nexus website submenu that you can see on the left. There's like this kind of cool slide out menu. That is super specific. It is. Um, so you see in the demo here, uh, if you click on the menu on the top left there, it kind of comes out really quickly. At first, it's just a little set of icons, but as you hover over them, you get different options. That is amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the future. The future is right now, Nick. We're in the future. Tomorrow's today. 
and yesterday is gone. So um, they go through and show you how to recreate all of this. And it's actually not as complicated as you would think, um, but there is still quite a bit that you have to do. Um, so they go through, they show you all the different markup that you need and uh, the different divs that go into it. Um, there's also some interesting things that they do with the CSS. You have to set all the box sizing to border box before and after. Anyway, there's actually quite a bit of code here, so I'm not going to go through and explain all of it. But a little bit of code, a little bit of JavaScript, and you get that great Nexus website menu. So check that out. CodeDrops always does an amazing job. Boom. Boom. Pretty awesome stuff. Well, next up is Salvatore, which is an alternative to jQuery masonry. jQuery masonry, of course, solves that really weird problem where you have a bunch of stuff and different columns, and you have some strange gaps between the bottom of them. jQuery masonry will remove all of that extra spacing and push everything together. Well, Salvatore does the same thing, but it uses CSS-driven configuration. So as you can see here, we have a couple of different boxes, and I want you to pay attention to the numbers on each one of these boxes. Normally, if you were to just lay this out with HTML, you might have one, two, three going down, and then four, five, six in the next column, and so on, because you have to lay everything out in order, and then you basically use CSS to squeeze together all these columns. This, uh, this alternative uh, allows you to lay out elements going across columns, which is pretty difficult, and then it will even get rid of all of that spacing. The way it works is by using HTML5 data attributes, so you say data columns, and then in your CSS, you can go ahead and set the number of columns that you want for that particular element, and all of the nested elements inside of it will go into that flow or to that number of columns. So pretty nifty, pre, pretty nifty stuff. There's a, a ton of customization that you can do, so definitely check that one out. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a project called FT Fast Click. Uh, this is from FT.com. And this tackles the problem of lagged input on touch devices. They go through a little bit of background about JavaScript, and for the most part, JavaScript events were meant for mice. So, you know, they're meant for clicking. Now, on the iPhone or Android, you know, any touch device, you don't have the click event. What you have is the tap. But since there's no specific tap event in JavaScript, it's approximated by having a 300 millisecond delay when you tap something that will fire the click event. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot of time, but when you're actually tapping on stuff, it's it's quite a bit of lag. Yeah, if you're, you know, if you're used to a native app versus uh, you know, a mobile web app, you can definitely tell the difference. So they came up with this plugin called Fast Click, which lets you programmatically remove that delay from either a single element or a bunch of elements at the same time. Uh, it's really, really easy to use. You can see they grab uh, a button right here in JavaScript and then just say, hey, throw a new fast click on it. And that's it. That's literally all you have to do. Um, there are, of course, more options that you can do with it. You know, only bind to certain things. Find out when you want to have the touch start and end events fire. A uh, ton of different options, but really, really a great piece of JavaScript that you'll probably want in your applications. So that's about all we have for today. Nick, who are you on Twitter? I am at NickRP. And I am at JCypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check us out on YouTube. You can find us at youtube.com slash GoTreehouse or search for us in iTunes at The Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile development, business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.